Can a computer program be judgmental, ageist, even racist? Yes, says our next guest. In Baltimore, Maryland, we welcome Frank Pasquale, author of The Black Box Society, The Secret Algorithms That Control Money and Information. And Professor Pasquale, it's good of you to join us on TVO tonight. I want to start by asking you about that title of your book, which uh, is a bit of a double entendre, I gather. What do you mean, The Black Box Society? Yes, well, it's wonderful to be on. And what I mean by the black box society is there's a couple of different meanings in black box in our cultural understanding. Uh, one being that black boxes, after there is a plane crash or a tragedy like that, we often have people looking for the black box. They're trying to understand exactly what happened, and these black boxes record at this point, you know, thousands of variables, what's happening on the plane, and record the sound and other things like that. Um, what I argue in the book is that this type of black box surveillance, this recording of everything that is done, that's increasingly being used not just for technology like planes, it's being used for persons. So for example, your cell phone can keep track not only of where you are, but how you walk, even your heart rate, biometric information like that. So that's one black box. It's like the black box has moved out of the plane and into our daily experience. You write in the book, quote, to scrutinize others, while avoiding scrutiny oneself is one of the most important forms of power. And I wonder whether you're seeing this form of power increase as technology advances. You are, and this is the second meaning of black box uh, that is really critical, and it's how engineers talk about black boxes. So in an engineering diagram, if there's some part of a machine where they don't really want to explain how it works, or perhaps people don't even know how it works, they'll call that the black box. Inputs come in, outputs go out, but nobody knows how the inputs were transferred into outputs. And this is increasingly a problem for people who are being scored by credit scorers, because essentially the credit score may take in hundreds of variables, it may have multiple shifting equations that are processing them, but nobody knows exactly how it works because it's a trade secret. And this is a huge problem because you have these very large corporations that are watching every move we make but we don't have an opportunity to understand how they're processing the data and to challenge it. Well, that is the point, right? They know more and more about us at Google and Facebook, but do we know anything more about them or what they're doing with our information? It is really hard to say. These companies, especially the large ones you just mentioned, Google, Facebook, the big tech monoliths, they do have some opportunities for transparency. They do have some opportunities for people to question, say, why their web ranking went up or down or something. But ultimately, it's a black box. And particularly, if you think about Facebook's newsfeed algorithm, a lot of media companies have been upset because they're saying, we can't understand the rules of the game. We don't know how you're determining how to prioritize certain things and how to deprioritize other things. Of course, one of the things they're doing with that information is marketing stuff back to us that they think we'll be interested in based on what they know about us. What's the harm in that? You know, the marketing uh, fingerprint here is a, is a really interesting one. When you think about how essentially there are so many firms out there that are trying to gather data points about us to figure out exactly what to market to us. Um, there was recently a report by the Federal Trade Commission um, called Big Data, a tool for inclusion or exclusion. And what it stated was that very often there can be marketing directed to vulnerable consumers. So for example, there was a data broker list that referred to the gullible elderly, and that could be purchased by casinos, who say want to target people that may want to just get rich quick. There are also lists out there of people who suffer from bipolar disorder. And so if you worry about, for example, mental health disorders being something that an unscrupulous marketer could target in order to uh, provoke certain behavior by individuals, that would be a big concern. Okay, so that's clearly why our online reputations matter. You gave us some good examples there of why. Can you, can you take that the next step and tell us why some of those automated judgments about us online could end up uh, with very serious adverse consequences to our lives? Sure. So it goes well beyond marketing. Um, what we're seeing is that the data tools that we're pioneered by marketers to try to understand individuals, these data tools are now moving into various other realms. So for example, in healthcare, we might see a lot of predictive analytics used in healthcare. 
But what we're also seeing is that sometimes these programs are deployed without adequate attention to quality. So there was a patient advocate named Dave DeBroncart, and he thought that he was going to upload all of his information and get some very good medical records and say even predictive analytics about how he should be treated. But it turned out that the processing of the data was bad, and it actually indicated a conflict of medications that didn't exist. And what we're seeing is that in an increasing number of areas, there can be either bad data, inappropriate data, problematic data that's getting into places where it shouldn't be. Credit scores. What concerns do you have about uh, what they are and how they're calculated? Well, these credit scores um, are very common in the U.S. context as a way of deciding how to allocate, say, mortgages, loans, uh, credit cards, et cetera. And the big move here is that it used to be that the bank would decide whether they're going to give you credit or not. Now, with this sort of calculation of a score, they can say, well, if someone has a score of, say, 820, we're going to give them credit at a 2% rate or a 3% rate. But if someone has a score of 620, then we're going to force them to pay 10% or something like that. And this is a huge issue because, as I calculate in the book, the score could cost someone tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of dollars over the life of a mortgage. And is it, in a, I mean, the score itself, is it put together inaccurately and therefore adversely affects someone? There have been reports that have stated that at least 28% uh, of credit reports have clearly erroneous information on them. There are other reports that have stated that the credit scores are widely divergent. So it might matter whether you get scored by one entity or another. And without knowing exactly how it's done, we don't really know, you know, is it fair or is it not? Okay, let's try another score. What's the body score? <laughs> so there are all these entities out there. There was a great report uh, by Pam Dixon called The Scoring of America, which described just literally hundreds of different scores that are out there. And what I call the body score is essentially it's an amalgamation of all these different tools that are already in existence to assess someone's frailty, their likelihood to adhere to a medication regime, et cetera. Um, for example, the same company that scores people's creditworthiness also scores what it pr uh, proposes is their likelihood to adhere to medication. So they're given a medication adherence score. Um, there are other scores that are like frailty scores that would say this person is either frail or not so frail. And in the right context, that could be very helpful, right? If you know that someone has a high frailty score, you may want to ensure that they have a lot of help getting in and out of bed at a hospital. But on the other hand, I certainly would not want employers getting access to a frailty score if they were deciding whether to hire someone or not. Because I think that that's something where if it escapes from its native context and goes into other corporate contexts, it could be used against people. Well, let's take this to the next level, if you were, uh, if you will, rather. And uh, this was really quite disturbing when I read this in your book. Some data marketing companies have profiles of people with identifying characteristics, and I'll quote a few here. Probably bipolar, or daughter killed in car crash, or rape victim, or, and one you talked about earlier, gullible elderly. A uh, few questions here. Does a person, for example, labeled as a rape victim have any way to A, know about it, or B, do something about it if that's what is online about them? Unfortunately, many of these companies are based in the United States, and thanks to very expansive interpretations of our free expression clause of our Constitution uh, in the First Amendment, oftentimes there's very little people can do in terms of uh, if this is framed as an opinion about them. If it's reported as a fact, technically they could sue for defamation if it's wrong, right? You could, you could go after them. But the problem people face practically is there are at least 4,000 data brokers that are maintaining this type of information or other controversial information. And even if you went to 10 a day and demanded your profile, and first of all, many of them won't even give you the profile, but let's say that you know, they did decide to do so, even if you had 10 a day that you went after, you'd still have 400 left at the end of the year that you wouldn't know what the information was about you. So we really do live in a world where you've got these sort of star chambers, these secret dossiers about everybody that are circulating among in these data brokers, and who knows where they'll be used next. Let's continue with an excerpt from your book. We're calling this Subjectivity as Science. Technocrats and managers cloak contestable value judgments in the garb of, quote, science. Thus, the insatiable demand for mathematical models that reframe subtle and subjective conclusions as the inevitable dictate of data. 
If these models can reflect subjective views, can they, for example, going on a bit of a limb here, but let's see, can they be racist? I think they can. And I'll give a very practical example of this. Um, there was a advertising algorithm that was matching up ads when people's names were searched. And an African-American computer science named, scientist named Latanya Sweeney was upset to find that when she would search for herself on Google, the ad would come up and say, Latanya Sweeney, colon, arrested, question mark. Then she just, you know, on a lark, typed in Tanya Sweeney. And then the ad said, Tanya Sweeney, we found her, or something like that. And this was for a background check service. And what she was essentially uh, suspic suspecting was that names that were often associated with African Americans were being associated online with uh, an arrest question, whereas other names were not. And she did confirm that. She did empirical research that confirmed that. And I think that's a real problem, you know, because I think that this type of thing is something that can happen in many different areas. People may not even be intending it, but it may just reflect user behavior, which is also problematic. Hmm. Let's talk about how this all has an impact in the world of finance. And I think, uh, you know, the Academy Award Best Picture nominee, The Big Short, has got us now thinking again about what happened back in 2007, 2008, the Great Recession. This relationship between secret algorithms and the financial collapse. What can you tell us about that relationship and the conclusions you've drawn about it? I have drawn the conclusion that actually what is often called a black swan event would be better called a black box event. <laughs> so the, the term black swan is meant to convey this idea that everybody was just going about their business. They were using uh, risk models and you know, just the perfect storm happened. All the wrong things happened at once and that crashed the global economy and hurt the global financial system. Um, what I'm finding instead is that what is characterized as something no one could have predicted, first of all, some people were predicting, so you know, that sort of gives the lie to that narrative. But even more important, so many of the key institutional players at the heart of this we're hiding information, or obscuring information, or creating instruments that were so complicated no one could hope to understand them. So what I try to explain in the book is that there were many good faith efforts by auditors, by regulators, by others, to figure out exactly what was going on in the global financial system, and they were deflected by lawyers, uh, sometimes by technicians, by traders, by others, and that that opacity is the key to the problems in the global financial system, and that we need to do a lot more to cure that. In which case, as computers get more complicated and these algorithms get more secret and more hidden, uh, do you think we're entering a world where increased regulation or certainly making these companies adhere to these regulations is going to be increasingly impossible? That is the core question, right? And I think that we are getting to the point where if we permit certain entities to continue trading in incredibly complicated instruments. If we permit, for example, certain decisions to be made by machine learning algorithms where essentially there is so much data processing going on in such opaque ways that no one on the outside can understand them, then those areas of human endeavor will be very difficult to regulate. Or at least we'll have to uh, turn to regulating the outputs and not the actual processes that are going on there. In which case, how are we going to have any hope in bringing more transparency to something uh, which by design wants to remain opaque so that we can't look at what they're doing? Well, fortunately, there are some really good models here about how we could improve things. So for example, the Office for Financial Research in the United States is releasing reports about trying to ensure that there's data entry that is explainable to those on the outside of institutions. You know, so I think that's a really critical thing. It's not just about asking entities to be more transparent. It's about data gathering, data collection practices that are going to be much more open to other outside inspection. So for example, if you have like standardized reporting in all these different contexts, that will help a lot. But we need to be really sophisticated about this. You know, I mean, there, are, there can be situations where information overload can be just as bad as opacity or lack of transparency. And so that is where my hope is. My hope is that as we become smarter about the problems of the past, we're going to insist on data release regimes 
that are transparent and that are usable by other individuals. Let me play devil's advocate though for a minute here and say that there are companies that have spent uh, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in research and development trying to make sure that they develop, quote unquote, the, uh, the special secret sauce, which makes them uh, number one in their field and uh, continues to make them huge players uh, on the world stage. Why should we, uh, why should we wanna mess with what has made them so successful? That is a great question. And I think that you know, the balance between valuable trade secrets and trade secret protected information and public accountability is always gonna be a tough one. But here's a line I would draw. I would say that essentially, when trade secrets are used to make something like chocolate or a machine or some non-living entity, you know, then I really respect the innovators who have created these trade secrets and I want to create a legal regime that's going to protect what they've done and not allow other people to discover it and copy it. But when we get into a world where the trade secret protected data and algorithms are sorting and ranking and affecting people, that's a different world, right? And I don't think we can just transplant the legal regime that protects trade secrecy from the physical world to the world involving individuals. A key aspect of human dignity is that we understand how we've been categorized, how we've been classified, how we've been treated. And if we don't have the opportunity to look into that, then we're drifting into a world where essentially very powerful individuals, as mediated by computers, are controlling us and we're not uh, sort of democratically holding them accountable. That's Frank Pasquale, the author of The Black Box Society, joins us on the line from Baltimore, Maryland, where he is a professor of law at the University of Maryland. Frank, it's good of you to join us on TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.